Hello. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, as you know, the, the workshop sessions are recorded so uh, for our archives so that we can go back and, and see sort of uh, the discussions in more detail. Uh, my name is Marko Kazupčić and uh, I'm very happy to welcome you this morning to the third uh, workshop uh, on the topic of open source institutions, which is a workshop as a part of a, a development of the project of, on open source institutions in Europe that Center for Advanced Studies of University of Rijeka is developing with uh, several other organizations, including Radical Exchange Foundation and Vitaiwan. The general idea of the project is to uh, is a development of a digital deliberative system, which would allow for a stronger uh, collection of uh, collective intelligence and participation in decision making and problem solving uh, with regards to public policy. And uh, our first session in this third workshop uh, will be. Uh, is concerned with the development of Citizens' Council, uh, in particular with development of Citizens' Council as part of European Capital of Culture project. We have Maria Katalinic and Berdar Koludrovic from uh, Rijeka 2020 European Capital of Culture and Rehab as a specific unit with, within the organization uh, who will tell us about the development of the Citizen Council within that context. So, uh, Kristina Stanovice-Hajic, my co-researcher on this project, uh, if you have something to add before we let the, our guests... Okay. Thank you, Michael Luka, and, and uh, thank you, Mari and Bernard. Uh, I'm just going to uh, give a little bit of context to how uh, this project um, is developing so far. So um, we were inspired by Vita Ivan's uh, model of um, collective intelligence and public deliberation. Uh, so what was interesting to us is how, uh, I mean, the model itself is very advanced and very, I mean, um, uh, interesting in itself, but it also was a big question for us how to get people motivated to participate. So like the model is one thing, the art of the research is the other, and then, uh, but then the, nothing works if you do not have people who are actually willing to share their opinions and to take part uh, in, uh, in public deliberation. So when we were thinking about uh, what kind of models uh, we have in our, uh, uh, I mean, in, in our town, we, uh, I mean, your citizen council came, uh, came up to us, you know, we remembered how that was a very interesting initiative where people could um, actually um, just, uh, they, they were motivated to participate, they applied and they were chosen. I mean, you will tell more uh, about it to us, but this is an interesting basis uh, and actually it's a very encouraging to us that there are people who want to actually take part in, in policy making and who are just like citizens. So this is why we would like to hear more from you and to hear how was uh, your experience with doing that project and if you see some connections um, and advices to, that you can give us uh, for, for uh, this project. So. Thanks, you, thank you, and I'm very excited to, to hear from you. So Bernard will give the beginning of the session, kind of the core of the whole Council Citizen, uh, Citizens Council, and then I will be in the second part giving more a reflection of you know, how did it work out? What was the feedback and how did it all work? So Benna, whenever you're ready, feel free to start. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, 
it might be that uh, Maria and I will overlap in some informations and points we're going to give. Uh, but the general idea is that I will introduce how the program was developed, why it was developed, uh, and what was the uh, methodology behind the whole concept. Uh, so the first is kind of the context of what and how it happened. Um, one of the pillars of Rijeka 2020 as European Capital of Culture was to produce uh, a participatory program uh, that provided the framework for participation and engagement uh, for citizens. Uh, one of the general ideas is that the 27 Neighborhoods flagship program uh, was the, the cornerstone of, of that program, but it was across the county. So we needed to develop something that was more focused on the city uh, because the city as, as, as a unit has different uh, problems, different concepts, but also Rijeka as a city has already some programs on the level of the city uh, that were similar. Uh, our general goal was to increase the participation across the board. So not just in decision making, but also in uh, producing projects, delivering projects, understanding how the city functions, uh, what is the role of active citizens, uh, of course, to increase the visibility and ownership of European Capital of Culture as a project uh, among citizenship, uh, but also to develop the audience. So it, it was a multi-level um, uh, purpose of why to introduce a participatory program within the European Capital of Culture. Uh, when we speak about uh, Citizens Council, or I would speak more broadly about the partic participatory programs uh, developed from Rehab, those are Citizens Council, uh, Green Wave, and Civil Initiatives. The, the, the last two are basically a uh, grant system for, for projects. Uh, the first idea was, okay, we are now in early 2000, uh, 17, uh, and we did a bit of analysis what is happening in the city. Uh, and I will give you some points on uh, what were our conclusions. So, uh, back then, city of Rijeka was uh, perceived as most transparent city in Republic of Croatia. Uh, we have several indicators for that. One is the public finance institute that uh, during the course of 2016 and 2017, uh, rated city of Rijeka as the most transparent city based on uh, different uh, uh, levels of how public finances are presented to the citizens and how citizens are included in uh, decision making about public finances. Uh, the second analysis was by uh, Association Gong uh, and Association of Cities in 2014 that concluded that City of Rijeka has the highest transparency index and accountability index. Uh, in that analysis, uh, Rijeka received 9.6 out of 10, and the average uh, uh, evaluation of other cities and municipalities in Croatia was 4.4. Uh, so we were actually quite high uh, on that scale. Uh, so that is the general perception by some analysis or researchers uh, or research about city as transparent city. Uh, on the other level, we have several um, points of how Rijeka is providing the citizens with possibility of participation. Uh, back then, but even now, we have several uh, programs designed by the city. Uh, one is the Rijeka Local Partnership Program. Uh, that is basically an open call for projects by the citizens uh, that can basically be anything that the citizens want. It can be a cultural program, it can be upgrading of a public space, it can be greening of uh, some concrete uh, area in the city or additional greening of a park. So multiple choices exist for projects. Uh, the key point is that the citizens propose the projects, but an expert commission decides uh, which projects are going to be funded. And also, once the select projects start to produce, uh, the whole funding and uh, project management process is guided completely by the city. 
So uh, the teams have an idea and some perception of how to deliver it, uh, but the process is to a large extent controlled uh, by the city. Uh, so in that program, we have very low level of participation and some level of engagement. Another program called Small Communal Actions is also an open call model, uh, but not for precise projects, but rather for ideas of uh, additional communal works that could happen in certain neighborhoods in the city. So for example, uh, across your house, you don't have enough trash cans. You want to increase the number of trash cans. Uh, uh, you are lacking the parking spaces in your neighborhood. You're lacking uh, benches in the parks around your neighborhood. So basically whatever is uh, considered a communal uh, inventory and it's lacking in your neighborhood, you can propose uh, that to your uh, local board. But then again, the local board is the one who is deciding uh, which projects or which ideas are going to be produced and when. So in this program, we have, again, very low level uh, of participation, actually almost zero, uh, and very low level of engagement. Uh, the third program we have selected to kind of give an analysis or to, to learn from was um, called uh, Aktia Zapet, Action for Five. It was designed by uh, Gong and the city of Rijeka. And that is the program that is including, that is uh, for high school students. Uh, once a year, a couple of hundred of high school students are invited to come to uh, to the city council to organize in, in, in project groups. They are given a specific task or an issue uh, and they're asked to design a solution, a project that kind of addresses that problem or that issue. Uh, the decision-making process is very participatory because in this model, the high school students let's call it the plenum of those participants is the one who is deciding which projects, which project is going to be funded and then produced. Uh, and again, the students are the ones who are producing the final, the final project. They are being mentored and guided, but this is the example of very high level of participation and high level of engagement uh, of a program that is kind of co-designed uh, or co-run by the city of Rijeka. The fourth element that was very important for those two analyses uh, that I mentioned before is the inconsultancy. So basically the city has uh, a legal obligation to consult the public on every bylaw that is being decided in the city council. That is in the interest of the public. Uh, it is provided on the website of City of Rijeka, but general assessment is that very low interaction with the citizens uh, is provided on that platform uh, because in majority of cases the only uh, public the only audience that is interacting is the expert or very interested audience so we are lacking this kind of an active citizenship uh, momentum uh, in this platform the other one it's not necessarily a participatory or engaging uh, platform but Again, it's on the official websites of the city of Rijeka. It's called Tujibaba. I'm very not sure how to translate it to English. Uh, so it's a platform where the citizens can complain uh, about some problems in the city. And the general idea behind that platform is that the city will answer the citizens uh, with concrete solutions or proposals of solutions based on their reflections of the problems uh, of everyday life, of communal problems, and so on. So that is. Uh, across the board what is happening uh, in the ECA regarding participation and that is in somewhat uh, controlled or designed or co-produced by the city of Rijeka in 2017. Uh, in that time we have concluded that um, okay we have some models we have some experiences we have some practices uh, but in the end they have produced very low level of participation, very low level of engagement, uh, especially in the decision-making process, which was very strange because uh, at that time, now as well, the city of Rijeka is uh, 
very proudly boasting that it is including citizens across the board in decision-making process. Um, also, uh, other conclusion was that uh, the programs didn't reach uh, a broader audience, but rather only the already active social groups, for example, representatives of NGOs who have been active even before those programs, uh, interested groups that uh, have either particular knowledge or particular self-interest in uh, developing a certain program or, or, a, or a solution in public space. Um, for, for example, uh, uh, the climbing associations and societies are very willing to have uh, hiking trails from the city starting to the mountains being you know, properly uh, maintained. And that is kind of a communal problem, but they are the very specific and uh, social group with self-interest for that particular project. Um, also, the third conclusion was that the efficiency of services provided by the city uh, is not designed uh, on the lines of user experience, but rather on how to accommodate certain programs in the already existing uh, departments or how the, the city administration is being run. Uh, so we felt that there was a necessity for a paradigm shift that is more focused on the citizens uh, as users, but also then as active uh, users and producers. Uh, the second step was to uh, look what has happened for the last 30 years regarding participation around the world. And we used several uh, examples uh, or guidelines for our ideas. Uh, briefly, of course, Porto Alegre case from the late 80s uh, was something that was of interest. Uh, my personal um, involvement with that process was some 10 years ago uh, when I met Giovanni Allegretti and was on his workshop about participatory budgeting that was completely designed on the case of participatory budgeting program from Porto Alegre. And that workshop was actually for uh, people who want to not just learn how participatory budgeting is done, but rather how to implement different models of participatory budgeting, budgeting on local levels. Uh, the other um, example that was much closer to us was the Bologna regulation from 2014 uh, that uh, regards the uh, inclusive decision-making process participation as, and engagement uh, as a tool for uh, the, uh, defining the city as a common. So not just uh, certain services or certain aspects of life that have been defined as a common or commons, but rather the city as an ecosystem uh, to define as common uh, and therefore all the citizens sh should be free or be provided with the opportunity to participate, to, to engage, uh, should be encouraged to self-organize and to deliver actions. Uh, other, even closer example was uh, Pazin Proračun, uh, a program that was designed by City of Pazin, uh, Gong Association, and uh, Association Nasha Djeca. Uh, again, this, this case was quite similar to Porto Alegre participatory budgeting, but was completely, uh, not completely, but rather it was uh, contextualized on the case of Pazin and specificity of Pazin as a city. Uh, they provided the citizens with the opportunity to deliver uh, I believe 10% of the city annual budget uh, to, to decide how to uh, uh, use 10% of the city's annual budget. Um, the other three uh, ideas or, or examples that we used were uh, the case of city of Lisbon, uh, Rennes and Graz. Those three cities have different approaches on how to increase participation and engagement. So I'm not going to into details, uh, but the general idea is that uh, all three cities provide citizens with similar ideas that we ended up with. So the decision-making process, but also the participation in designing, producing and delivering uh, projects. Uh, what was very interesting in that case was that the city of Graz actually has a complete department city department 
uh, for citizens' participation. Uh, at least as a gesture that shows that the symbolic uh, uh, value of participation for the city of Graz is quite high. Uh, if we compare the results of our analysis of what has happened in Rijeka and what examples can we learn from, uh, we decided <coughs> to design a participatory program that includes uh, citizens as the ones who are proposing the projects, but not just the idea, but rather a sust substantial project, uh, providing them with funding to deliver that project, uh, but also to increase the accountability for, for the project. Uh, we had a problem of how to design the system that it functions uh, that the ones who are proposing the projects are also the ones who are uh, decision making, who are decision makers of which projects are going to be funded. Uh, at that time, we didn't have an elegant solution how to do that. So we decided to uh, design a citizens council uh, as a decision making body, a participatory decision making body, but not uh, from the plan or from assembly of uh, the teams who proposed the projects. So we had two levels, the, the projects and the grant system and the decision-making citizens council. Uh, the general um, layout of the city citizens council was uh, based on the 2011 census that stated that Rijeka has somewhere in between 130 and 150 thousand population. So we used that number as a guideline and decided to have the Citizens Council uh, should have 15 members. Uh, and then the sub uh, subgroups are also divided by uh, the statistic data from census. So from the 15 council members, we had seven male and eight female council members. And that number has been then uh, reduced for age groups. So for example, in the group of, in the age group from 16 to 19, we had one male, one female. In the age group 20 to 25, we had two male, one female. Uh, in the group 26 to 40, two male, two female. Uh, 41 to 65, one male, two female. And 66 plus, one male, two female. So those numbers reflect uh the statistic data uh, from the census how in age and gender groups uh the population is divided we felt that is kind of the the numbers that are representing or mirroring uh the population <clears throat> status in the city and briefly that's the concept behind citizens council Hey, thank you so much, Bernard, for, you know, giving the context as you follow, you know, how everything developed. It really, you know, he was there from the beginning and really knows uh, where the inspiration and everything came from. So I'm just going to share my presentation as, you know, Bernard said, some things were over, will overlap. So sorry, Marco, can you just make me a co-host so I can just share a screen? But through the things that Bernard over the inventions, I'll just go through faster. Uh, and should. then later in the Q&A, whatever is needed. Okay. Sure. Uh, you should be able to share the screen. Optimize screen share. Okay. Okay. It should yep. work. Sure. Yeah, it's working. Okie dokie. So, uh, from the start. Okay, so as Bernard said, I'll just, you know, we'll talk about Citizens Council. Bernard already mentioned, you know, you know, the levels of citizens council, you know, civil initiatives and green wave being the, you know, the grant system through on which the citizens council was deciding upon. And then we also have the fourth baby, which is volunteers, because everybody was volunteering in this and still is volunteering in this process. Uh, and when I'm saying volunteering, people were able to get grants for their projects. They were able to get some small of simulation for their work. But most or mostly, you know, people were doing this pro bono. Also volunteers who, are, you know, is also a very special part of European Capital Project, one of the most successful parts of Legacy. You know, everybody's still indirectly or directly involved in grant system and Citizens Council was a volunteering body. 
So, um, sorry, wait, okay. So what is very important for, you know, to have people come together and to activate them something, you know, we heard about in the beginning and accept what Bennett was saying, having a very, you know, uh, thought through structure that leads people, get, but gives them enough space is also to have a space for them. So rehab is, and why this was, it still is a very successful thing is that rehab was a new infrastructure in the center of the city that was intended to motivate and to activate citizens. And so as you can see on this slide, you know, we in this space had a culture information center, a participatory program center. There was also a co-working space because it's a space about 100, uh, 1,000 square meters. So, you know, there's space for everybody. And the whole idea was that the community building pro programs, which is Citizens Council, anyone who has questions about the grant system, people doing activities of their projects were also able to come together in the rehab. So having a center where everybody comes together and can talk about and discuss things and educate was really how and why it was such an accessible event. So currently, Rehab is not functioning under the Rieka 2020, but you know, in the last two and a half years, uh, it really was a hub for citizens. And that's, I think, why a lot of um, success was uh, seen. So as Ben was already saying this, I'm just showing you a small picture where it says, get involved, Rieka waits. Um, you know, this was the campaign that was going through the city in two rounds. Um, whether it was very successful or not, I'm not sure, but it was an attempt. So this is a pilot program. This is something that we were always telling ourselves, it's a pilot program, it doesn't have to work out, but you know, if it fails, at least we tried. So luckily, as Bennett was saying, we did have success in, um, in getting the people motivated. So Citizens Council, that was also, as I said, coming to Rehab, so as you're seeing, this is an image from one of the citizen council uh, meetings, everything was held in Rehab. So their uh, main agenda was to review project submissions submitted by citizens to do on those two grant levels, so which is uh, Green Wave and Citizen um, Civil Initiative, and overseeing all aspects of civil engagement in the participatory program. So as I'll, you know, how it all, all worked from the start is that we had a public lottery which is, as uh, Ben was saying, you know, uh, describing on the levels, uh, in the scheme of age uh, and sex and gender, how they were selected. So in the first round, as you can see, we had 31 men applied and 45 women, and in the second, 10 men and 43 women. So the women were kind of a constant, which is also very interesting sociological, uh, so to say, experience that, that, you know, women were more open uh, and especially, you know, two groups of uh, between 30 and 41 and 41 to 60, that was like the target, the main group that was really responsive to all our um, kind of actions of getting involved. Men, not so much, and especially uh, younger generation, that was very difficult. Uh, in the end, what we learned was that reaching out to younger citizens was to really go in the area where they hang out. So, bars, uh, pool tables, uh, the, you know, certain concerts, everywhere they went, kind of advocating about getting them active was to be done on the field with them. So, the, the, you know, the campaign that weren't directly one-to-one -one with them were not so successful. As I said, to the other groups, uh, much more. When it comes to men, we still don't have, you know, some kind of solution back up, like, you know, what, what was wrong. Uh, but what we realized was that um, women telling their husbands or their partners or their friends who are, you know, male gender to get involved, that was kind of the success. So this is really has to also to do with the cultural context, sociological context, you know, and, you know, people feeling that it's their space to take. So why public lottery was such, I have to really say success and Vesprem, which is also one of European capitals of culture coming up are gonna take, um, they said they're gonna use this uh, method uh, because, you know, as I said, a cultural context and the sociological context, the thing is that, you know, um, there is some PTSD from uh, previous corruptions 
and uh, not knowing how the government and got local governance works and you know feeling they cannot be involved so public water was a perfect example of having the most transparent simple um, action that would you know let people know what's going on so if you can see on this we had this big bowl uh, that was filled with numbers and uh, I remember in the first one we couldn't find some like nice chic uh, balls to open. So Vernon had this idea and I think we were trying and it wasn't working and in the end we uh, went to buy uh, uh, Kinder eggs for kids. And then we would put numbers in that and had like those symbols of Rika 2020. And so the idea was that on the right side we would have um, a public noticiary, uh, uh, we would have um, a lawyer, people from Rika 2020, who would, you know, we had lists of all the groups of age and gender and sex, and then we would, you know, take out each number and being like, number one, you know, it's Mirna Greblo from the, and so people, as you see on the left picture, they, we, we invited everybody who applied to come to Rika. They were there, they could see us opening, they could see the list, they could see, you know, that everything was legal. And that really kind of gave them the sense that, you know, there is nothing schemey. There's, you know, we don't want certain people to get elected instead of other people. It really was an open uh, lottery competition, as you wish. Um, so that really was one of the best uh, key ideas and decisions, I have to say, and that really kind of stick with people. And after that, they, they kind of opened up because they saw that we were just honest and constantly saying it's a pilot program, you know, be gentle with us, we're gentle with you. Uh, we just want to see how this could be working. So that proved really as a good experience. The second thing that was very important in the Citizens Council was like constant input. And when I say constant input, you know, my, uh, our third colleague, Eva Lulich, who was fantastic on this project, really was like passionate and, you know, energetic about everything. She was calling us the, like a customer service for, for the citizens, because you really are, you're constantly with them, talking with them, you know, when they have certain confusions, like, why is this person elected? Why was this not, you know, what's going to happen with the grant money? Tell us honestly, you really have to be there, answer the questions. Which, which can be tiring, but it, at the end, it was really worth it. So as you can see on, this, on these three images, what we had was like uh, constant lectures, workshops, education, not only education that the Council of Citizens went through with, um, with, uh, with an NGO who was really there, uh, Nasha Zaklada, to give them uh, a very skilled educational approach to thinking about community and what's needed for community. I'll just skip forward. You know, thinking about criteria that was leading the people to apply for mini grants, but also criteria of thinking what's needed in the community. So these are some like, you know, that the, all the projects need to be local, they have to activate citizens, bring an innovative approach, but still be sustainable. So not only, you know, having ideals, but you know, having this practicality of placing them in the public realm. Visibility, you know, um, is it possible to be executed? You know, do you have the funding? Do you know what you're doing? And to be accessible to all. So people of all um, races, difficulties, uh, educational background, it has to be open for everybody. So after this first important educational chunk, and then throughout the whole year, they had lectures, as I said, workshops, uh, presentations, uh, them getting connected not only among themselves as Council of Citizens and kind of getting to know each other, but also with the grant apl uh, applicants. Because, you know, as Bennett was saying, it's, it was the same pool of thinking of how to activate the citizens. And what happened was that you know, actually not many people knew each other. We thought this community is a small community and that people would know the grant applicants and the Council of Citizens. That would be a very strong kind of tricky connection. And, uh, and we were very afraid of nepotism, but in, it turns out that, you know, the community is much larger than we thought. It's just like, it's dotty, so it's very scattered. But bringing them together really kind of worked on the second round being you know successful as well having 
new applicants, what we thought was not possible. We thought the same will earn a, you know, are always going to be uh, applying. So in the second round, we had about five current from the first round uh, members of Council of Citizens reapplying because they were so kind of like happy they were in the first. And also we had about, uh, I would say kind of 10% of people who applied for a grant system and won the grant system reapplying in the second round. So as Ben was saying, you know, the, and we, I will touch, touch upon this, the, the, the whole, well, not problem, but issues with having participatory program in this community or any community and, um, and the benefits, so to say. So overall, we can, you know, the Citizens Council was a very, uh, for happy groups of people who, you know, got together, went through workshops, different backgrounds, you know, different personalities. Sometimes it was tricky, uh, but in the end, it was very successful. So I'll just go through this really fast. So they were designing, as I said, civil initiatives. You know, these are all images from all of them, uh, which was, some was just like, you know, uh, occupying an illegal parking lot for kids and putting in murals. Some was for um, elderly citizens to dance in rehab um, when the co-workers, hipsters left. Some was like uh, having cooking uh, education for people who are widowers who's just alone and lonely. The Green Wave had an idea of greening the outskirts and the city center's public um, spaces. A, there was a lot of educational activities you know, walking. So um, this is also one from the second round, which was successful in the first and then got reelected in the second, which is um, once every first Saturday of the month, uh, there is a music uh, playing for citizens for one hour for free, or just like, um, you know, greening uh, the middle of two very important big lanes in the outskirts of the city center. So, you know, they were, so the, the Citizens Council not only elected, so they, when they were educated, this sounds bad, educated, but when they went through this educational program, they got, a, so to say, a book with all the projects who were, you know, uh, well applied and, and they had everything, you know, in this boring bureaucratic way um, checked. They got all those projects, they went through it, they could decide on it. And then whoever got the most points, then there was, uh, we had uh, election nights. And so it, it functioned in the way that it wasn't just like who had the most points won, but it was that who had the most points then had to go, that project had to be, you know, we were, you know, moderating all the, the things being like, okay, Papa Park, you know, got most of your votes, votes is everybody still okay with, you know, Papa Park getting, I don't know, 5,000, well, not uh, 30,000 kuna was the most, but let's say 4,500 uh, euros. And then if everybody said yes, then no problem. That was immediately going, you know, to, um, as a proposal to get uh, funded by Rika 2020. If somebody was like, well, you know, I read about, I don't know, this thing where I heard about it and I think it's messy, I don't really like it, I want to revote. Then that revote could really get everybody to start discussing. So what happened was in that moment that you, did, you just didn't have this like cold, you know, just, you know, tick the boxes, give the amounts that you think is um, the best for each project, but you really made them discuss every project and, you know, think why did they give that amount of uh, points or why should they maybe not go? Maybe somebody was feeling bad that day and then they were kind of like angry and they gave everybody bad points, but actually today they're good. And hearing everybody else, you know, giving uh, great arguments why certain projects should get elected, they changed their mind. So it's really like an intense but very exciting democracy, you know, happening right there in Rehab. And those election nights, were lasting for about between three to five hours. You know, people were exhausted. Uh, we needed to get coffee and sugar and water and people sometimes got angry, but then we would kind of like ease it out. And so, uh, as I said, it was fantastic, it was exciting, but it constantly needed somebody following them and being there, sometimes just support, 
sometimes uh, organizers, sometimes moderators, sometimes their friend, uh, because they wanted to feel uh, recognized as people, as professionals, as, you know, for them, like councils members. So it was very, it, it still is very uh, inspiring to see how power, you know, and keep in mind, they're not getting paid. They were coming for, you know, uh, in their free time, they had kids, they were, you know, some were quite older and weren't so easy to, to come so often, but they were coming over and they were being a part of this and they wanted to be there. And so sometimes the basic hospitality of getting them a cup of coffee could get them to be there for three to five hours. So it's the little things that really matter when you're working with people. It shouldn't be cold at any point. It really has to be constantly reassuring to everybody that you want their knowledge and their opinion. And so just to kind of uh, start with this, so, you know, participation, collaboration, community, as I said, you know, getting people, as Ben was saying, getting people involved. And so one of the key things um, I just want to read from this was to net create networking, which happened between, you know, people and their NGOs and their initiatives and stimulating collaboration between citizens and the civil, city, city government. And that is really something I'd like to kind of like almost end. Let me just see the time because this is something that I really want uh, whoever is thinking and, and for us as well working here. Uh, that is kind of the knowledge that needs to be rethinked because so our um, and Bernard feel free to later on as I finish which is soon uh, if you want to say something more so the city was supportive in the way that they want uh, people to become uh, engaged and not only you know grant system but really citizens council but what's needed for this communication and collaboration to be successful is really actually to have educational learning practices with the city council which was in the beginning a part of idea of like 2020 unfortunately there's just so much program it was no time and and space or human capacity because getting people activated if the city governments is not ready for that activation is not a good idea because you have people who are very now motivated they want to be a part you know they want to talk about things they want to discuss what's cap you know what's implemented in the public spaces they want to know where the money's going but you still have this old system of the local governments being like nah, we're not sure how is this going to work and if you have this we're not sure what happened is that people get angry which is what you don't want because anger then leads at some point to just lethargical behavior, which is like, I don't care anymore. So you always have to navigate between the local governments and telling them it's going to be fine. These guys are amazing. You want to let them in. You want to give them power. You want to give them support. Of course, everything, you know, in moderation, in not moderation in sense that like give them a little, but you know, let them be a part of those things you know, where they could really make feel important and make, and so it's easier on you. You don't have to decide, I don't know, if this part gets six benches or, or four or three, but they can tell you where the other three can go. So ease up on the local government's power, but also give them some power. So in, in, in the case of Rieka, there was some movement in the way that two of these, uh, so to say, uh, bodies could work but there's just not enough time for this to come together. Um, that's my kind of opinion. There is good progress on this, but there still needs to be more effort. And so uh, it's a bit sad that, you know, as the project's ending and projects like European Capital of Culture have really high targets and really want to do a lot. But as I said, human capacity, money, and time. Time is really, you know, kind of the most stressful factor. Don't allow for this to perfectly continue on. So what good did happen, except this fantastic community and uh, them being motivated and active, is that, uh, you know, Bernard was mentioning this uh, development of local partnership program that's part of the, the, the local Rijeka city governments. So they saw in this year 
that less people started to apply for that program and wanted our program, and when I say our, I think like at 2020, to continue for them to reapply and continue with them. Um, so that was for us a good feedback that this kind of participatory works better than the one that was you know, offered from the city governments. So unfortunately, the, the, the person, the, the, you know, uh, the office who's leading this in the city is not yet ready to open up their structures. This is something I referred to just a bit ago. But they did say they're willing to have from now on, instead of just like three council members of their own who they decided is, you know, are experts in this, to include two citizens who will then be a part of this decision making. So that is a progress slowly, but you know, safely forward. And I'd really like to, um, I've been advocating this constantly to have the Council of Citizens somehow in the local governments. I don't know if that's gonna be able to happen. We're having re-elections next year. And you know, I hope that somebody, either the, the current you know, politicians who are there or the new ones who might show up or not, um, kind of think about this because you know, Rijeka is currently a dying city. There's more people dying than being born. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of young people leaving. Um, so there needs to be actions, and I'm, I'm sure there's many of these cities all around. There are, you know, citizens and cities of such who are small and, and don't have a very strong economical security will need to think of ways of getting people to be a part of the city without actually spending too much money. You know, these are not big budget projects. So uh, that's kind of uh, everything from me. Uh, and so I'll stop the screen sharing and uh, can't wait to uh, hear more from you. And Bernard, if you have something to contribute, feel free. Yes. Okay, uh, just a few, um, something came to my mind. Uh, what Maria said that Rijeka program for local partnership compared to our grant system uh, resulted in increase in the numbers of projects applied to us and decrease in number of projects applied to uh, Rijeka program, program of local partnership. Uh, the whole key is exactly what Maria said people are not included in the decision-making process and they are not the ones who are overseeing the programs. But uh, what Maria and I forgot uh, to mention is that unlike other grant systems, we have provided the opportunity for informal initiatives to be able to uh, submit the project proposals. Usually the grant systems are based on NGOs or any kind of formal organization or institution as uh, the submittee uh, or applicant. Uh, but in our context, we have decided that uh, informal initiatives should also be included uh, because you don't have to have an NGO to create a solution for your neighborhood. You can be just a group of neighbors who share the same problem and the idea how to solve it, but you don't have to go through this formal process of registering an NGO, having the statue and so on and so on. Uh, so we felt that uh, the necessity of accessibility of the grant system uh, is more important than some obstacles regarding the legislation that is designing how uh, an LLC like, like Rijeka 2020 should or could function. And so I'll just uh, top up uh, what Bernard you know, explained, which is great was that actually more civil initiatives became then NGOs because people wanted to step up the game. You know, they, they were like, okay, we see how this project management is going. You know, we see, we've been talking with people from, you know, uh, local governments. We know some people, we want to do this. And so now you have really hyped up people, but you don't have, you know, you don't have, uh, to, you, I don't know, a structure to offer them or like money to offer them. So now it's like, so as the rehab got closed because, you know, with the pandemics and we lost some budgeting and we had to close the rehab for Rijeka 2020, you know, people started having petitions like open rehab, you know, where do we meet? What do we do? Where do we hang out? So 
so that's kind of what I was saying, like, you know, that when you stimulate, you better know what you can give them. Because if you stimulate and leave them to on their own, it's just going to create a negative uh, feedback. Thank you very much both for your talk and for your great work. I have a bunch of questions, but I would first uh, sort of uh, see if maybe somebody else has some questions to begin with. Francesca, yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for uh, this uh, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, mine is uh, something uh, in the middle between uh, a comment and a question. Um, I think that very often, both in uh, public discourse and uh, but also in academic circles, uh, we can come across the uh, assumption that low, the low level of political uh, and civic participation in Eastern Europe is grounded in the socialist past. So there is this. Uh, uh, like shared idea that civil society had to be built uh, from scratch uh, after the transition. And uh, uh, personally, as a historian of socialist Yugoslavia, uh, I can say that the issue of participation was uh, very much discussed, uh, at least uh, uh, since the 1960s. If by uh, participation, uh, we mean the idea that uh, um, citizens can uh, influence the management of the uh, local uh, community. And I think that th there were uh, uh, several examples of uh, uh, decentralization of decision making uh, uh, in different bodies, uh, from uh, neighborhood to workplaces in uh, socialist uh, uh, Yugoslavia. Of course, many initiatives were not that successful. Uh, very often there was a top-down approach, but I, I think that it would be unfair to uh, reject that experience uh, completely. So uh, my question would be, um, did you or uh, did any of the participants, because uh, as we could see from the pictures, there were, there were several participants from uh, uh, the uh, generation that experienced the, that system. Um, so did any of you see any potential connection between uh, um, that legacy from socialist Yugoslavia and nowadays one? Or uh, do you think that it's possible to uh, draw uh, at least some aspects of that uh, uh, experience to increase uh, nowadays participation? Uh, well, if I can say definitely, so I, if I at any point sounded that, you know, we were or I was rejecting the, you know, the communist, definitely not, Hi, Francesca. but it's just like, so definitely the generation that went through the solidarity movement was very much more engaged than the younger generation. That's why they were more responsive. But it took a while, so they were definitely, yes, let's, you know, be a part with what we were saying, like, you know, people need to volunteer. They were saying like, it's just work actions, just call them work actions, you know, it is what it is. But when you were with them, they were always quite skeptical because as you said, it went from, you know, the, the socialist to, you know, transition war times and now here we are in, you know, some neoliberalist part. So it went, so they had the solidarity in it, but they had to have a kind of, uh, a check back like are you sure you're not just trying to be one of those you know uh use me and then you don't care about me thing so you, that's why i kind of said like you really had to work with them to to really show them that, that you mean well but definitely the solidarity and all the hair all the legacy from the socialist times in terms of like sharing time giving your time uh giving um understanding and compassion and for all that was very much in all of them. And we're talking generation like 41 plus. So, right, so all of them, you know, whether they were kids, well, the, the, you know, 61 plus were more in this, what you're, tell, you know, talking about, but 41 to 60 also had reminiscence because of their parents and all of this. Yeah, but what, what kind of happened now with the volunteering system and volunteers who work on different kind of cultural level projects is that they're mostly, 
there is younger, you know, older community, but there is a lot of younger community. So it showed that, you know, when you got the older community kind of to be a part of everything, the younger were kind of like, oh, it's not lame to volunteer. You know, it's not lame to give your free time. So it's, it's now it's showing a shift. So thank you for your questions. Bernard, if you want to uh, contribute, feel. Okay. Um, the legacy of self-governed interest community or some open interest in as a model of self-governance in Yugoslavia was a legacy that was part of our brainstorming of how to develop uh, the framework. Uh, we are not ignoring the legacy, but we are choosing not to use the same symbolism or the same uh, names or the same titles. Uh, as the European Capital of Culture project, we have to remain politically neutral. So when we were developing back in 2017, we were very careful uh, not to uh, reminisce some parts of the history that might be very difficult for certain residents of the city. If, if we are designing an inclusive model in an inclusive framework, uh, we have to be very careful as the European Capital of Culture not to have this uh, wrong steps of how to name stuff, uh, how to design stuff. So it was something we were very careful about, uh, but something that is unavoidable as a symbolic or collective memory or experience that is remaining in everybody who has taken part of socialization processes in Croatia. Christina. Uh -huh. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much. This is such a valuable, uh, valuable knowledge and valuable experience uh, to us uh, since we are uh, thinking about, um, well, I, uh, okay, it's a different system, but it has uh, many similarities. So we can really learn from you, and it would be. Um, I mean, um, we would appreciate if we, we, we could share this knowledge, I mean, with you in future as well. Uh, because I would say this project has, uh, maybe it has an extra ambition because it intends uh, in uh, creating a space for policy making. Uh, so it's a more, uh, a direct impact on on, um, on management of the city on in, uh, because uh, yeah I mean that is a very hard part and um, we are aware but thank you for for reminding us that it's very problematic in terms of democratic process to engage people and then not see through uh, their decisions and their uh, I mean uh because that can even worsen uh the trust uh, in democracy which is already lacking so uh for me this this is a very important um point and and thank you for bringing it up mm, i wanted just to i mean i also have so many things to ask you but uh let me start from from this thing so uh, first bernard when you were talking uh about the other participatory initiatives uh, already is existing in the city, you were saying that uh, usually the people who would apply for it were already in NGOs or um, already active uh, in a way. So did you have a different experience with the city, uh, with the um, citizens uh, council? Did you actually uh, manage to reach uh, those people who were not uh, previously engaged in NGOs or previously active, and how did you manage to do that? This is my first question. Okay, I can start, but maybe Maria can also uh, include her uh, idea of the answer. I believe that we have attracted um, some people who have not been active already, uh, even in the first uh, council. How we did it, I'm not really sure. Uh, the campaign become involved uh, took place, let's say, a month before uh, the application process. Uh, 
so we had some visibility in the city that was uncommon for example as a RIECA local partnership program they don't have any visibility uh, we toured the city with with a van uh, locating on several locations around the city uh, you know dealing flyers talking with people advocating this uh, in the public space so that reached uh, some audience that was maybe unreachable but by usual means of uh, disseminating information about this type of, uh, of program. Uh, whether or not that resulted with increase of uh, previously not activated citizens, I'm not sure, but it definitely increased the visibility. In the end, if they picked up the information about it elsewhere and then uh, developed the motivation to apply, it's unsure. But maybe Maria can tell more if she knows from personal experience with yeah. council members. I mean, it was very interesting because a lot of people, um, so, you know, this is, this goes against us, but, you know, it's such a big project and there's so many levels of what this project's about that a lot of people didn't understand what, what European, you know, what ECO Creta 2020 is. So when they saw this public campaign, a lot of them thought that they're going to get close to the project, you know, like getting to know the people in the project, getting to know the CEO, getting maybe employed, um, like trying to see what's happening, you know, like what's happening inside. And then when they, you know, when we were like, oi, you know, you're just, you're, you know, this is a pilot, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna get this. And they're like, do I get paid? Do I get to sit in the city, send, you know, city council? Block? So there's a lot of, you know, nobody really knew what the campaign was actually about because this process is so new. So I think the mostly the people got out of curiosity involved randomly. Very few of them actually, you know, knew what they were going to do. But because in Riha we had this info time, well, in the second, in the first, we were just like thrown in fire. They were just coming in whenever they wanted and calling whenever they wanted. We were trying to constantly explain what the process is about. And so in all that month that Ben was saying, you know, people kind of like those who got it and said like, okay, I still kind of don't get it, but I want to be a part of this and I want to go to the city hub because it's new and these kids are doing something. They were there. But all of those who were like, oh, I just wanted to check and, and it's still messy. And of course they're messy and I'm out. So, you know, it wasn't like people actually knew what the council was although we really try to explain you know what it was about it's just like it, it just people couldn't get like what francesco was also you know kind of referring to like through the systems why would you do that and how would that work so i don't know if this explains completely but it, it was really like you know you know work as you go yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's cute. I mean, I, I remember I was on one of these voltings and I remember this atmosphere, you know, like, uh, and, um, but yeah, I mean, again, they were interested in this big project that all town is talking about, but this is again a, a, a motivation. You, you use this kind of a moment and this energy to, to, I get to them, which is, I think it's a very good thing. And, and getting to this kind of a diverse, uh, really diverse uh, population, it's, uh, it's very precious. I mean, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I just was gonna say, because the thing is, the, the, the problem was that, you know, everybody wanted to be a part of the project. Mm -hmm. But the, the concept that European Capital Project Program does not mean that it's a, you know, it's, a, it's made on the base of a book that gets selected and that, that gets implemented. People thought, you know, that somebody was going to go in the middle of the city and be like, oi, you know, who wants to do what? This is, you know, for you. This is for the city. And the fact that that was the wrong perception of what the European Capital Project is, once we had this public campaign, people thought like, oh, finally, like, I can talk to somebody. Like, mm -hmm. I can tell them what I think. And so that's, what you were saying, absolutely. You know, whatever got them inspired to reach out and wanting to talk with the project, metaphorically and also physically, was good. You know, kind of to get you know get them out. Yeah, yeah, and that's very interesting. I mean, how actually there are people who are dormant in a way, but 
they are looking into this kind of institutions, especially new things that are going on, and they want to know what's in, what's ha what's going on in there. Maybe this is like a point to us that university could also be this kind of a place where people would like to have a sneak peek into what's going on there, you know, like and how, yeah, um, they can contribute. Yeah, uh, uh, one more question maybe. And so, um, did you have? Uh, because you were talking about relationship with city council and about uh, with the decision makers in city council. Um, like, uh, did you have them on board? Uh, and how did you manage this kind of connection and communication between your project and uh, between... Okay. Yeah, it's a very challenging point for us because we really need to have them on board before starting the process of, of public deliberation and policy making. Uh, we didn't have any communication with city council because the city council doesn't have any authority on this type of activity. So we had the discussion only with the city administration. So basically the department for urbanism, department for uh, communal services, uh, department for uh, local self-governance, uh, Restoration, like, uh, yeah, the official, yeah, Ministry of Culture Restoration. Uh, in the first round, uh, the decision-making process uh, within the Citizens Council started first. And from the applied project, the Citizens Council decided which projects are going to be funded. Then we went to the city, to the departments, uh, and discussed with them how to uh, produce those projects. That was a failure from our side uh, in steps uh, because it ended up that some parts of some projects could not be delivered in those spaces in that type uh, in that time uh, so for the second round we have decided to kind of shift uh, the process so the, the city administration would be the one who reads the ap applied projects first and then the, the the citizens council receives only those applied projects that were approved as feasible by the city. So we learned from the process, but uh, uh, I have to say at some point, the representatives of city departments were very collaborative, but in some cases they were very difficult uh, and not understanding the whole point behind participatory program. It's not about putting a bench somewhere. It's about having the possibility to have the idea that you want that bench right there and the possibility to, to put it there. So that, that was a, a difficult part of communication between uh, us, the Citizens Council and the uh, departments of the city. Yeah, because we kind of went, the first time we went like very idealistic, you know, like, but, but that's also, just to kind of like uh, disown us for, from all the, the blame is that we thought that part of that part was solved. So we thought, you know, kind of like whatever we say, it's going to work out, but we didn't know that part wasn't solved. So basically we were the ones doing it without knowing it. So first we went very idealistic, like, oh, it's going to be great. You know, we all want to be a part of this. But then it was like, no, you know, in, you're in the bureaucracy system and not any. You're in a creation bureaucracy system and that's hell. And like, there's no idealism. They're just like, you know, there is a lot of advocacy constant. So Benner was, what Benner was saying, like, you know, we had to shift from idealistic to being very practical and but but also constantly being transparent so telling the council citizen this is why we changed this is why it needs to happen this is why we lost so much time this is why some things didn't happen it, it's our fault but it's all if so everything had to be super transparent so you had to say you had to step up you had to like pick up your problems you had to you know tell them but then as Brenda was saying like sometimes it's kind of like maybe it's like raising children i don't know i don't have kids but it's like letting them go but then being like whoa 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 like you know you're being too harsh now like come back you know like you have to like come back to me like we need to talk this through so you know a lot of time like a lot of time went into kind of like making things smooth and nice so in the end i think we succeeded in this collaboration but i'm just afraid that because the the participatory are not continuing 
and that these connections were really kind of like worked on for the past almost three years that I'm afraid once we, you know, stop being a yeah, creative 20 project that it will stop because now it should continue, you know, like somebody, something should continue these connections and get people to get implementing their projects into the system with this, uh, let's say, you know, kind of good vibes, whatever, with the local governments. And if I may add, sorry, Christina, uh, what happened is that uh, during the 2000, uh, the 2019, uh, basically we were, the participatory programs of Rijeka 2020 were the only ongoing uh, program happening in real time. So during the 2019, we had Tobogan Festival, Port Etno Festival, maybe some activities uh, around the city and neighborhoods, but basically the civil initiatives and the Green Wave were the key point or the cornerstone of uh, program activities during the 2019. At that time, uh, the city administration, what Maria uh, said, did not realize how difficult uh, European Capital of Culture program is to implement in the city. Once we were there, uh, and for example, I remember one meeting, uh, there were 20 people from the city administration because nobody wanted to take uh, charge or ownership of a small part of administrative work that somebody else is doing. So we needed to have everybody on the table because everybody's in charge of just that small part, but nobody wants to deal with the other part. Uh, now, or actually uh, in the end of 2019, the city realized that their model of uh, coordination and communication with a huge project as European Capital of Culture is, is not very productive. Uh, and they decided to implement a unified coordination body that is then uh, spreading the information within the city administration, but also forcing the decision-making process to be faster and more uh, understandable of what is the goal of certain question or, or idea that is proposed to that coordination. So we did actually, in the end, achieve uh, more efficiency on the side of the city, of, of the city administration, but whether or not it will last beyond uh, European capital of culture is uncertain. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you for sharing that. I mean, uh, like, uh, what my impression is that it's really important that there is space for making mistakes. I mean, this is not mistakes. This is the like learning from the process and constant experimenting. This is how we also see, um, I mean, this project. I would like, I mean, it would be great if you could be here for the for our third workshop where we will, will go again uh, um, into the model and and uh, talk about these twists that we did in the methodology in the meantime. Uh, but what I uh, wanted to say is uh, this kind of transparency and the right to make a mistake uh, and the ownership of mistake or, or, uh, as well as of, of good, good things that are uh, uh, produced in the process, it's so important. And I mean, and this is what, I mean, we are constantly talking about trust and how much we need trust from each side in order for this to work. And this seems to me like a model so of, of building the trust. So you go and you, you, you show everything that you did, you, you're being very honest and transparent and you own your mistakes. So yeah, this is, this is a very important insight from, from you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, because at the end, what I learned is that, you know, people are very smart and intuitive, regardless of their like backgrounds, you know, they'll sniff out if you're faking in a second. And that's what Council of Citizens was amazing. If somebody application was like, I'm going to do this for this money, they'd be like, you know, on this meeting, they'll be like, this guy's faking, you know, I'm going to Google him. I Google him. He's faking like we, we cannot get this project. So yeah, in the end, you know, you sleep peacefully and everybody can then be like uh, more giving in different ways. Thank you. I think that Tanya and then Kevin, if I'm right, also have the question. Yeah, cool. So uh, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, I do have a quick question about how these citizens councils can actually continue after um, 
the European capital of culture. And I noticed uh, when you were speaking about the city administration that, of course, there was reluctance and the idea of them uh, allowing space for the council to function. And you mentioned the kind of learning experience that you had of having some projects be uh, unfeasible and then realizing that it should be passed to them first. I'm curious as to whether or not the citizens councils had any direct communication with the city administration or if it was always mediated by uh, involvement from European capital culture people. So thank you. Bernard, if you can just answer, I just have to answer this call and then. Okay. Uh, okay. The, the council is not in any way connected uh, with city administration because they are not needed to. They are citizens who are given the opportunity to decide whether or not they want some program to happen in their city. They shouldn't be even connected with the city administration. They should have, like the city council has a bridge that is communicating with the city administration. Those are the heads of the departments. So the city council is not communicating with, with, with uh, administration directly. In the same way, the citizens council did not communicate uh, directly uh, with the city administration, but rather used us uh, uh, as the bridge, but also as a buffer uh, with the administration. More importantly, uh, the, the selected projects uh, and the pro team project, the teams who were uh, producing the projects, they were the ones who needed to have more communication with the administration because they needed to learn how to get the permits, how to get uh, some service from the city activated. Uh, to some extent, we were, again, the bridge uh, and the buffer, uh, but some of them got really encouraged and empowered uh, and did those tasks, tasks themselves. So that was, in a way, a victory for us because uh, the number of people who were empowered or engaged or felt free to ask for the services of the city increased. Uh, but of course, we received, that's why we were the buffer, we received a lot of uh, pain in the ass from the city administration because they were not used to this type of communication with the citizens. So sorry, I was listening, but we we have an event tonight, so I'm like doing that. But anyway, so but I heard what Benno was saying, and that's true. I mean, the Council of Citizens, the Citizens Council should have maybe more availability to get connected with the local governments. We tried to do that through uh, workshops when there was also presentations, and then we would get everybody together, and then they would talk among each other and get connected and pose these questions. But, and I definitely feel, and thank you for this question, that the, the council should be more um, about their role, more like thought of, you know, it should be more complex. It's just like there, there's no time, but it definitely should think like, how could that work? You know, and what part should they be in? Maybe not all 30 of them, but maybe what I said, like what they're gonna try to do in this year, like having two members, you know, in, but you also, for that thing, you need somebody who's managing these people. And as Benna was saying, when we had these meetings here, you know, the public administration is large, but everyone's, you know, doing a little thing in the whole system that they're responsible for. And to have a person, you know, on a paycheck like we were, who manages a council and this and this, you know, the, the city, I think it's also a question of budgets and employment and other stuff. That's why this project was so fantastic. And so it's just a question like whether, you know, some money can be gathered or if, the, you know, but then when you have, you know, you have to plan that for the next five years. So it is a question of management and finances in the end, I guess. I mean, just to sort of follow up on that, it just seems like a more of a comment than anything. It seems like your project has really shown how important it is to have some sort of capacity or people who are um, happy to and want to help everyday people make an impact on their city and mediate that relationship between the government uh, and administration and people themselves. Um, so I hope you figure out a long-term way to sustain that somehow. 
Yes, thank you. And that's something, you know, I think um, uh, Francesca was saying in the beginning, because the whole idea is, you know, not having any more or trying to kind of disengage this like top down approach, but having at the same time a very strong, well, not grassroots, but you know what I mean, kind of like bottom up. And so that for that, th there needs to be a space. And so, uh, you know, who decides on the space? is the people who decide on the daily politics. But, uh, you know, these things, as you said, you know, show or maybe, you know, create tectonics that maybe this is a colleague of mine said this the other day, that are maybe not now visible, but they're definitely happening. And so in maybe four to five years, you might see, you know, a very strong tectonic that demands a change of something. Uh, and if I may answer a question that that was left unanswered, uh, we do not plan to advocate uh, the continuation of Council of Citizens because we, as an LLC or as a project, have a definite end. Uh, so we have presented pilot case study that is up to the city to decide whether or not it's something that they want to encourage that is useful for the city, uh, and it's up to them. And what Maria said. Uh, there is a wind of change. Uh, more people are getting engaged, more people are interested in how the city is operating. Uh, it may not be 2021 or 2022, but uh, definitely the numbers of active citizens have increased. Uh, and if not Council of Citizens, then some other form of of participation or at least pressure on the existing administration and power uh, uh, power bodies uh, will emerge in the near future. Just a quick follow up. Um, I'm curious as to whether the Citizens Council um, started to feel any sense of authority to act on their own behalf. Um, I, I've, I'm familiar with certain uh, attempts like in, in Berkeley and other places um, where people sought city permission to plant a community garden in a vacant space and the city was reluctant or simply didn't respond. And they felt that at that point they had the authority to do these actions directly. Um, painting murals, beautification, community gardens, playgrounds, that they reached a point where they felt as citizens they had the authority um, that did not need to go through elected city officials or departments. I'm just curious as to whether in your experience you saw any of the participants realizing, oh, we are the Citizens Council, so we can do this. Well, here we had more, more with people who uh, were conducting uh, projects by the grant system. That's happening from them mostly, you know, because the, the, the council, the citizens council was more like, you know, kind of a supervision body of what these guys or girls are doing. But, the, you know, we had a lot of situation where now somebody does something, they're like, we're part of the participatory program. We're like, oh my God, don't say that. But so uh, th that's happening, which I'm kind of okay with. Like, you need to shake up the system. I'm, I'm okay with this happening. Um, but we did have once, this was a funny, when a, a, a member of the a Citizens Council came with a parking ticket and she was like, I'm the, you, uh, you know, I'm the council and I don't need to pay this ticket. I was coming for my, you know, election night. I'm like, you know, honey, you're paying for that ticket. Just like, no, the city's paying. I'm the, you know, the member. So, you know, there was some like kind of things like this happening, but it's all like pretty nice, you know, soft. So, but yeah, as I said, the the grant the grantees are kind of like the filibusters here. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that we will absolutely sort of uh, be in further contact with with uh, the two of you with regards to the project we are developing. And as uh, because I think that your experience and your knowledge is is sort of 
extremely important for for this this idea of this project which would in a sense try to uh find a way to to sort of make such a deliberative system such a participatory system sort of stick within the the institutional framework of of city decision making now and that is the as you noted sort of one of the most difficult aspects uh, i would have just one question before we go uh, you mentioned and this was sort of mentioned actually many times this idea that uh, and i'm thinking now in terms of of developing our project that uh, you were mentioning that the city council and city administration surely but also the city council as the as a sort of a decision making body uh, would need to that there is a need for educating them to have, to have and i keep sort of thinking that maybe there's sort of a first step in in developing this project of some kind of participatory system that would be that would presumably stick or or be long term should begin with actually just focusing maybe on on the sort of education and ad advocacy within the city council so I was wondering, this was sort of a comment question, but I was wondering if you could sort of expand on that or just if you had some ideas of what would that actually entail and so forth, so. Yes. Uh, back in 2017, we were very ambitious and not uh, necessarily realistic. Uh, Budget-wise, time-wise, human resource-wise, uh, and practically, uh, we did have a plan to uh, kind of have a parallel body of 12 uh, city employees. So, an each representative from each city department to kind of have this parallel uh, council uh, or a body uh, that would be our bridge to the city administration. So the ones who are deeply included in our process, but also know a lot of what those guys in administration is doing or are doing, uh, and to help us uh, to get some solutions or processes faster. Uh, we failed on that front uh, because it was very difficult to select those people to get them activated. Uh, so on multiple occasions, we tried to start to do something uh including them in the workshops uh inviting them to lectures uh, in the end we have targeted several city employees i would say 10 to 15 maybe uh some of them were very active some of them were seldomly active uh, but who understood what we were doing uh, majority of them were not on the uh, higher level of, of authority within the administration. So they were kind of a mid-level or low level of employees. Uh, but certainly they were kind of, you know, spies within administration that you could talk to uh, to get some information or knowledge. Uh, but yeah, we had a huge plan of how to educate them, how to include them, uh, but we failed on that front miserably. Partly on our side, uh, but a lot of the problem is on the willingness uh, of the city. So we didn't get the necessary response or feedback from the heads of the departments, uh, but also not uh, from the mayor. What we didn't do was go to the city council because they are elected representatives for a term. Uh, and. It, it kind of felt that we need to deal more with the administration because they're there long term. Uh, and they're the ones who are setting the, the rules, setting the framework. Uh, they're the ones who are manipulating within the, the set framework that, uh, that the council decides on. Uh, yeah, it's a trauma. But what Bernard was saying, basically, what we failed to recognize, and that's recognizing the system. And here the system functions, that you have the top person delegating what the people under, you know, in hierarchy should do. So that was not done. And if you don't have this here, then people don't listen. And unfortunately, the listening comes from, you know, fear, like fear of getting fired or fear or something. So because they didn't have this fear, there was no like, you know, um, 
decision, then they were like, sometimes they would show up, sometimes they wouldn't. And what Bernard was saying, and just to do that, you you should have like hired just a person to do that. It's like, it's an all day job, right? And so what Bernard was saying, you know, there was workshops and uh, things when some of them would come over, but, and what's important was that all of them, these 12 people from the local uh, government should have sat in rehab. So the idea is that they sit in rehab, the community comes to rehab, we work in rehab, you know, so it was like a really a center for creating this, you know, connection between the city power and the local community. And so, you know, getting also people to move was also not possible. So you kind of miss the point because it is very, very tricky. Yeah, I get it. But you were saying about uh, the the this is most you mostly focused on the on the administration due to as you said like they're the ones actually sort of producers of of whatever gets uh decided but with regards to this do you think that the level of city council themselves should have some aspect do you think that there is a there is a relation between this sort of participation in the city council as a decision making body that should be or do you think that the focus when when if you were to sort of go at it again you would focus on the administration as a sort of a most relevant part of the city structure that needs to be educated am i make i would say administration um yeah okay uh, in in whatever uh, research i've done before this uh uh majority of cases uh are pointing towards that the executive branch of local administration or, or local government uh, is the one who is setting the, the rules for this type of programs. Uh, I'm really not sure about the case where uh, the representative body uh, was the one who uh, set the rules or, or the playing field for this type of activities. Uh, whether or not they should be, I wouldn't say educated, maybe guided towards new ideas uh, is is definitely a bonus. I mean, but if you look how local political dynamics in the council uh, are developing, you're seeing uh, political pol parties having their interest in certain topics and disregarding other topics that are uh, out of their perspective or interest. Uh, and this is something that is more holistic, that is more, uh, you need to have the system, you need to have uh, the holistic overview of, of the city, you need to have multiple interests uh, in mind, uh, multiple processes. Uh, you need to have a certain, a certain, you know, energy. How to talk with these people? Uh, how to deal with these problems? So, I'm not having a feeling that that the council uh, or any type of representative body, uh, political representative body, uh, could be the one that is the keystone for delivering this or something similar. Uh, but as an ally or a stepping stone, sure. And I mean, I always remember, so I read uh, last year, I think Paris has uh, placed the Citizens Council in their local governments to decide on the green topics of small scaled actions. So, you know, for me, that, that's kind of like the first things that you do. What I tried to explain in the beginning was like, of course, you know, you don't get them to decide, I don't know, on the annual budget of each community, but like, you know, you kind of uh, take away your own responsibility by saying like, I don't need to think about every small green action in the city. We have the citizens council, let them decide on this. It's not big budgets, they can't mess up. But as Benna was saying, like put a bench, you know, it's a symbol of democracy and of uh, decision-making. So. For me, that would be, you know, uh, next to the administration, like those things. But again, you really need to have, as Bennett said, a person that has the will and the ability to talk because here, you know, the, the, the level that, you know, you work in the city council, kind of that feeling just kind of, uh, it, it's not fruitful. You know, you, you have to really have to be open to receive the input. So yeah, kind of a combo, hybrid of both, I guess. 
<clears throat> so, but thank you very much. So if we don't have any more questions, I think, uh, is Christina sort of shaking her hand? No, okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, then thank you very much for this. This was very interesting and thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. And uh, we're having two more sessions tomorrow when we will be uh, joined. Oh, Sanya also joined us. <laughs> Uh, tomorrow we will be talking to uh, about the development of uh, algorithms for uh, sentiment analysis because this is one part of the possi possibility of project is this development of a, of a sort of digital platform for a phase within the sort of a larger structure of, of deliberation. And on the third day we're going to have the sort of a wrap up session in which we would actually um sort of discuss the the phases the steps that the methodology of the system that we would be uh, that we have so forth sort of built through these workshops so of course if you are uh, if there is any chance for you to join us that would be amazing but in any case uh we'll be in contact like further on so thank you very much thank you everybody for your questions and uh, for being here and see you tomorrow hopefully thank you everybody. Ciao. see you bye. soon bye thank you so much bye bye, Ciao. bye, -bye.